Hello and welcome to your chapter seven video lecture where we are going to talk about the axial skeleton. So first we'll talk about the division of the skeletal system, but as a review, what are some of the functions of the skeleton itself? If you said to give a framework to the body, you are correct. We keep a rigid eternal structure that can support all of the structures and we're also going to provide a structure in which the muscles can attach to in order to produce movements of the body it's also going to help with protection especially with our vital organs for instance the cranium uh, protecting the brain and our rib cage protecting our heart and lungs and it also helps with storage functions for instance having calcium phosphate within our bones and then as far as the total of bones that we have in our body, on average, we have 206 bones in an adult body. So what is the function of our lower skeleton? It is going to be to create stability for when we walk and run. So then what would be the function of the upper skeleton? It would be for us to have a greater mobility and ranges of motion and to have features that'll allow us to lift and carry objects and be able to turn our head and trunk. So now let's really dive into it. What makes up our axial skeleton? It's going to include our skull, as well as the vertebral column, which we see back here, and our thoracic cage. And we are going to have 80 bones within this axial skeleton. The rest, of course, would be in our appendicular skeleton, which we'll discuss in another chapter. And the only bone that isn't connected to any other bone in the body is going to be the hyoid bone. And you could see that a little bit here in the area of the neck. Essentially, if you were to take your hand, slide it right under your chin and straight back, that is where your hyoid bone is. It actually is suspended by 22 muscles and ligaments. And then there are unique small bones that are going to be found in the middle ear. And that is going to be our ear ossicles. You may remember learning about this as the hammer, the incus, and the stirrup. Um, so we'll talk more about that later on. And then the skull will consist of 22 bones. We will venture into the skull soon to name all of those bones. And our vertebral column will contain 24 vertebra. This will include the sacrum at the area of the pelvis here and the coccyx, which is at the very tip here. The thoracic cage will consist of the ribs out here and the sternum anteriorly and within our median plane. Now let's quickly touch upon the appendicular skeleton. This is going to be made up of 126 bones. And you could see the bones here make up the appendages, hence the name appendicular skeleton. Now let's go into the skull. The skull is really divided into two major divisions. We've got the facial bones, which help make up our facial features. And then we've got the brain case or the cranial vault, which is really there to uh, protect our brain and also um, serve as areas where we're going to have sensory structures. So we will have the skull in reference to the term cranium and the only mobile bone of the skull is going to be the mandible and that's this bone down here our lower jaw now when we look at an anterior view of our skull our eyeballs are going to be contained here in the orbit of the skull when we move into the nasal cavity area this will be div divided by a structure right in the middle here known as the nasal septum and this nasal septum will be created by a couple um, different pieces of bone as well as cartilage. So the first part of that is going to be our perpendicular plate. And I'm going to draw your attention to this image over here. So this is a view if I were to make a slice like a sagittal slice down the skull and we are looking at the nasal septum here and up at that superior aspect we could see is our perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and then the lower area will contain the vomer we'll talk more about the vomer and its interest interesting shape in just a little bit 
And then we've got two sets of bony projections that are going to appear on the lateral wall. So I know this is a little bit small, but we'll see a uh, zoomed in version in just a little bit. The bony projections are found here in the um, blue color, and these are going to be termed concha. And so the largest set of this is going to be the inferior nasal concha where my mouse is right now. And the set above it will be called the middle and superior nasal concha. Now let's take a look at a lateral view of the skull. Here we are going to see the zygomatic arch, which is a combination of two bones. The zygomatic bone, which makes up the apple of our cheek, as well as in the purple here, we can see the temporal bone. And these two processes that are extending out from one another help create the zygomatic process and the temporal process where they come together to create that zygomatic arch. Down below here, we have our mandible that is articulating and connecting to the skull through the infratemporal fossa, as well as the temporal fossa of the skull. And this allows us to have that chewing motion take place. Now, when we are to cut the skull cap off, that portion is going to be called the calvaria, the calvaria. And we'll look at some views where that calvaria has been removed. Now let's talk about some of the plates of the skull, which are going to first consist of the parietal plate. You can see that here in orange. It is the same on the other side, so that's why we say it has two plates. Then we have our temporal plate, which you could see in the purple here, and this is paired as well, so we will find it on the other side. These plates were named because of their graying of the hair that would take place here, and especially with that word temporal, it comes from the word tempus, meaning time. So if you had gray hair on the side here, it would be your way of showing your time. And on this bone, we're also going to have this bump back here, which is known as the mastoid process. And if you just go behind your earlobe, you should be able to palpate that. If you're familiar with the muscle that attaches to it called the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is that large muscle in your neck, you can lead yourself over to the attachment site, which is the mastoid process. All right, continuing on these plates of the skull, then we have our frontal bone here in the pink. And this is just a single bone that we find anteriorly, and we will call this our forehead. That slight depression that we have in the middle here is going to be found between our eyebrows and called the glabella, the glabella. And the upper uh, margin here surrounding the superior aspect of the orbit that is called our supraorbital margin and in this margin you can see that there might be either a hole present or a little notch so we are going to call this the supraorbital foramen or notch supra meaning above orbital referring to our orbit and then foramen meaning hole and notch of course meaning a little little divot in there, right? And this is here because we have passage of a sensory nerve to the forehead. Next up is our occipital bone. So now we are looking at a posterior aspect of the skull, and this too is a single bone, and it is going to form the nape of the neck and has a structure called the superior nuchal line. Superior nuchal line here. Within this area, we will also have a large opening. Um, we'll see a little bit of a better view later on and I'll make sure to mention it, but this is going to be called the foramen magnum, essentially meaning large hole where the brain stem is going to transition into the spinal cord and pass through. Now in the skull, we also have this bone called the sphenoid bone, and you can see that it really has a unique look to it, and it's wedged in between the cranial bones and the facial bones. Within this cell, um, excuse me, within this sphenoid bone, we have a structure called the cella tersica, and it really is a little saddle in which the pituitary gland can sit within 
And another name for the um, pituitary gland is the hypophysis. So we call this space the hypophysial or pituitary fossa. Essentially, it's the depression in here in which the pituitary gland sits. Now, when we look at the sphenoid bone disarticulated here or looking at a superior view with that calvaria removed and the brain removed we can see that we have greater wings that's going to be this larger portion over here they're extending laterally and away from the cella tersica that we see here and they help to create the floor of our middle cranial fossa we'll see a little bit more of that later of our middle cranial fossa actually all of the cranial fossa and then we have more superior to that area is the lesser wing over here it's more of this triangular space which is going to form a prominent ridge between the anterior so maybe i'll point it out over here between the anterior cranial fossa and this middle cranial fossa where the greater wings can be found now our ethmoid bone is another one that is found more internally and it's going to be a single midline bone that's going to form the roof here and the lateral walls of the upper nasal cavity and it's going to contain the cribriform plate so let me show you where that plate is we're going to find it right along in here and if you look at this view of the nose of the nasal area, you could see the cribriform right along in here, the cribriform plate. And within this plate, we have lots of little holes where it'll allow olfactory nerves to um, move through so that we can communicate the chemoreceptor information that we're gaining from there through the holes of the cribriform plate, the foramina of the cribriform plate, and communicate that with the brain. So right along in here. We'll talk more about the specific pathways that we're going to take for that sense to be perceived um, in the senses lecture. Now for our temporal bone. As we said, we can see this on the lateral aspect of the skull, and that word tempus, if you remember, for the word temporal means time. And on the temporal bone, we have a lot of unique features, but I'll just mention here the external acoustic meatus, this canal right in here, meatus means canal, is our ear canal, which some of you may use a q-tip to clean your ear even though we're not supposed to be doing that but most people do um, and then over here we have our styloid process which is sticking out like a stylus like a pen and that is going to be there for attachment of muscles and ligaments now let's move on to the bony sinuses of the skull these are going to also be called paranasal sinuses para means like surrounding so we're surrounding the nasal area here and a sinus is really going to be a space within the bone that is going to contain nasal mucosa so first we have our frontal sinus so if you feel tenderness between your eyebrows here you might be having sensitivity within your frontal sinus then we have your sphenoid sinus so this is more posterior in um, relation to the other sinuses and the sphenoid sinus can be found just inferior to your cella tersica if you remember that structure where your pituitary gland sits then we have your ethmoidal sinus or sometimes we call these ethmoidal air cells and these are located around the nose and near the orbits and lastly, we have the largest sinus of all, which is the maxillary sinus. And these are found in close relation to the upper teeth here. Let's shift gears again and now talk about the sutures of the skull. A suture is a immobile joint where we will have a joint that is between two bones through interdigitation. So you can kind of see the interdigitations in here of those bones. And so that gap that exists between those bones are filled with dense fibrous connective tissue. And we have four prominent sutures. So the first one is the coronal suture. We are going to find that along in here. And really it's between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. Then we have our sagittal suture, which is going to extend posteriorly from the coronal suture, and it's going to bind our right parietal bone to our left parietal bone. 
Then we've got our lambdoid suture, which you can see pictured over here. This is extending downward and laterally. So we've got attachment to, between the occipital bone and the parietal bones mainly, and a little of the temporal bone. And then we've got our squamous suture, which you see laterally, that is going to be found between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. Now when we are a fetus and early on in our infancy, we are going to see that our skull possesses soft spots and these regions in the skull have not yet ossified and we call them fontanelles. So anteriorly we're going to find our frontal fontanelle or anterior fontanelle and more posterior we will find our occipital or posterior fontanelle so that would be found here and here. Now let's venture into the facial bones. Our facial bones, we'll start with the uh, maxillary bone or the maxilla here, will form much of the hard palate. So I put this sagittal view here. This would be part of our maxilla. And um, you, if you were to take your tongue and put it in the front of the roof of your mouth, that would be your hard palate made up of the maxilla. And it'll also make up the medial floor of the orbit so you can see that right along in here as well as the lateral base of the nose now some of the important features here are going to be these alveolar processes right along in here that helps to anchor the upper teeth we also if we switch back to this image here you could see the infraorbital foramen which is going to be this hole right in here. Again, that allows a, a sensory nerve to exit there and supply this area of the face. And then we have our palatine process. That is going to be this hard palate structure in here of the maxilla. The hard palate creates the roof of the mouth and the floor of the nasal cavity. So you may have noticed while you're looking at this, that we do have two thirds of the hard palate made up of the maxilla and then there's a different bone for the posterior one third and that is going to be the palatine bone that we find posteriorly. And I just wanted to show you the relationships for our hard palate here. So again, here is our maxilla bone. And then in the back here, we would have our palatine bone. And then back here would be our soft palate, which then transitions into the uvula, that ball hanging in the back of your throat. Moving on into our nasal bone. These are two small bones that create the bridge of our nose. And then if we move laterally from there in the teal, we can see our lacrimal bone, which is gonna form the anterior medial wall of our orbit. This was called lacrimal because the word lacrimal refers to tears. An anatomist used to think that the, this is the area where tears are produced. But later on, they found out there's a lacrimal gland here in the upper lateral aspect of the orbit that creates the tears, and then they wash over the eye and drain out through this medial aspect. Then we also have that inferior nasal concha that we talked about. I'm gonna elaborate on that on the next slide. And then in the center here, we have the vomer, and I'll elaborate on that too in a coming slide. So first is the inferior nasal concha. And if we were to look at a sagittal view of the, in, um, of the nasal cavity, we would find these rounded, coiled areas of bone. And so this one that we would find all the way at the bottom, it's the inferior nasal concha. The one above that is the middle nasal concha, and the one above that is the superior nasal concha. Now, note that the inferior nasal concha is its own bone, whereas the middle and uh, superior nasal concha are made up of the ethmoid bone. Um, so I almost want to draw a little line across here to keep the inferior one separate. And then if I were to take the face and slice it down, right about in there, and I were to look anteriorly, this is what I would see. So these are the orbits, and then right in the center here is our nasal septum. You could see the maxillary sinuses here on the right and left, and here would be the teeth. So when I'm looking in here, you can notice that we have this outgrowth of bone, 
that is called the concha. Now the concha was named after the conch shell, which I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, but in doing that, we create a canal. And so each of these are going to be called a meatus. So we call this one the inferior meatus. This one would be the middle uh, meatus and then the superior meatus. And this is in place so that when we breathe air in, it creates a turbulence to the air so we can slow it down and warm and humidify it using the nasal mucosa that lines this area. Now let's get back to that vomer. So the vomer, again, we're going to find making up the nasal septum. So I put the sagittal view up again, and here is the shape of the vomer. This was named after a plow back in the day that they would pull across the field and it would vomit up the earth. So that's what vomer means. It means to vomit. And so it got its name based on that. Not that it actually causes you to vomit, um, but this bone was shaped like the plow they used to use. Notice how in our nasal septum, we also have septal cartilage. So that'll make up the anterior piece of the nose. So that's why that part is missing here. And also we have other cartilage platelets that give us the shape of our nose. Continuing on to our mandible as a part of our facial bones, this is going to form the lower jaw and is the only movable bone of the skull. We have structures called the ramus. Remember the word ramus means branch, so this is branching up to meet the, the rest of the skull. Then we have the angle back in here where we see a bend within the mandible. And if we look at this upper portion here, we have a structure that helps create the temporomandibular joint. And so here we have the condylar process that's found posteriorly. And um, I'll show you another image in just a little bit of what this full joint looks like. And anteriorly, we're going to find this coronoid process. Make sure you say of the mandible because there's a coronoid process on the ulna within our forearm. And then we also have a uh, alveolar process down here too, in which we are going to anchor the teeth within. And lastly, the mental foramen, which is a opening again to allow a sensory nerve to come through. I forgot to add that anterior there. Make sure you fill that in. So let's take a closer look at the temporomandibular joint. You can see here is that condyloid process that is fitting into the fossa in order to allow movement of the um, temporomandibular joint. So here is a nice close-up of what this joint actually looks like. Again, the the bony structure in here, and you could see it placed over here as well, is going to be the condylar process of the mandible. And then here we are going to have the mandibular fossa. Now notice there's a structure sitting in between these two, these two bones. Um, first, let's highlight the articular cartilage, which is going to sit along each of those bones to create a cushion. And then we have our articular disc is what it's called that sits within here and that allows for a further padding of this joint. Now we, I said we'd talk about the cranial fossa. At this point, the view we're looking at, we've removed the calvaria and removed the brain, so we're looking down in the skull. So the floor of our cranial cavity is then going to be divided into three cranial fossa. So I want you to focus on the terms over here. First, we have the anterior cranial fossa. This is going to be the shallowest, and it overlies the orbit. So if I was to crack the bone in here, it would be right where the eye is. And we also have the frontal lobe anteriorly here. You would see two openings here, but this label is kind of covering it. Then we have our middle cranial fossa, which would include some of the pink in here as well. And this is going to uh, be deeper within the... Uh, not within, deeper than the anterior cranial fossa and has a butterfly shape to it. You could see there are a lot of little openings in here for passage of blood vessels as well as, as, well as cranial nerves. Then posteriorly here, mostly in teal, but we do have a little bit of um, this orange that's gonna 
be a part of it as well is the posterior cranial fossa, which is the deepest portion because it's going to contain the cerebellum of the brain. And there's that foramen magnum again, where we will get a transition from the brainstem into the spinal cord. And here's a little bit of a closer look of this cranial fossa. This in here would be the anterior cranial fossa. Then we have the middle cranial fossa and then the posterior cranial fossa. Now let's talk about the hyoid bone. Like we said, this is an independent bone. It's not going to attach to anything else and is suspended by 22 muscles and ligaments. Notice how it has a U shape and it kind of resembles a horseshoe. This is going to be located in the upper neck near the level of the inferior mandible. So here's our mandible. And it's going to create a base for our tongue above and is attached to the larynx and pharynx with those muscles and ligaments. Now shifting gears to our vertebral column. This is also known as the spinal column or the spine. And our vertebrae are separated and united by intervertebral discs. So those would be sitting in between each of the vertebrae in here. The vertebral column is here so that we can protect our spinal cord. We can divide it into three different categories. We first have our cervical vertebrae, which we have termed C1 through C7. So we have seven cervical vertebrae, and we have special names for the first two. So C1 is also known as the atlas and will articulate with the skull. And C2 right below it is called the axis, and that's going to articulate superiorly with C1 atlas. The next category or region is called the thoracic vertebrae. We're going to see this within the area of the chest, the thorax. And we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, which we are naming T1 through T12. Then in the lower back region, we will have our lumbar vertebrae, which we have named L1 to L5. So we have five lumbar vertebrae. Beyond that, actually let me go back. Beyond that, we're going to have the sacrum and the coccyx. So starting with the sacrum, that's going to contain five fused vertebrae, which you can kind of see the lines in here of where they have fused together, while the coccyx is going to consist of four fused vertebrae. Which two regions of the vertebral column are going to retain fetal curvature? So here we see that we definitely have some curvatures of the vertebral column. Um, and let me just draw in what our fetal vertebral column used to look like. So it used to be C-shaped like this. This is a bit exaggerated, but here would be our cervical curvature. This would be our thoracic curvature, then lumbar curvature, and then the sacral curvature. So it would really be our thoracic curvature as well as our sacral curvature that kept the same curve to it at, from a fetus um, perspective. So our cervical and lumbar vertebrae are said to have, let me erase this first, are said to have a secondary curvature and the thoracic and sacrum and coccyx are said to have a primary curvature because that primary is what we used to have as a fetus. What disorders can occur due to improper curvature of the spinal column or the vertebral column? First, we'll talk about kyphosis. So kyphosis can be seen in the middle picture over here. And this is when we have an excessive posterior curvature of the thoracic region. This is also known as a humpback. Then we have lordosis, where we have excessive curvature of the um, anterior curvature of the lumbar region. So this tends to happen when we have a lot of weight in our anterior abdomen, and it pulls that curvature in a little bit more anteriorly. Then we have scoliosis, where we have an abnormal lateral curvature, and that is accompanied by twisting of the vertebral column. So you could see an x-ray displaying this over here.
Now let's discover the structure of vertebrae. The large opening that we find within the vertebral arch is known as the vertebral foramen, and that is going to allow the spinal cord to course through all of the vertebrae to move on to the level of L2, which we'll talk about more in our nervous system. So I want you to understand that that spinal cord does not go through all the way down to the coccyx. It actually stops at in the lumbar region at L2. And then we've got um, the spinal nerves, which are going to travel through what's called an intervertebral foramen. So in between each of these vertebrae, there is a little hole here that allows that spinal nerve to course through and it can travel to its destination. What you feel when you run your fingers down the middle of someone's back is going to be the spinous processes of the vertebrae. So you can see those over along in here and from the superior view, there's your spinous process sticking out. And here's another view of those photos in case you wanted it a little bit more zoomed in. Now the vertebrae that articulate with one another are going to be through superior and inferior articular processes. So when you look at two stacked vertebrae like this, you will see a superior articular process and facet articulate or join an inferior articular process and facet. And then we also have transverse processes that stick out uh, laterally within the transverse plane that will allow the ribs to articulate with within the thoracic region. That's what we're seeing over here. But in other bones like the lumbar, those transverse processes just stick out for muscles to attach to them. Okay, now let's get into the three different regions of vertebrae. We're going to start out with our cervical vertebrae. So when we look at cervical vertebrae, we're going to see some unique features. We'll see a smaller body and we will see these holes known as transverse foramen. So those are unique to cervical vertebrae. Also, some of the cervical vertebrae will have this bifid spinous process. So having two projections instead of just one. As I mentioned before, we have special names for the first and second cervical vertebrae. So here is C1 or Atlas. This was named after the son of Titan and Atlas was a marine creature who supported the pillars that held heaven and earth apart. So here is a sculpture showing him holding the earth, the earth being our head. So that's why they named this Atlas and it would hold it on the superior articular facets. And note that it does not have a spinous process. It also does not have a body. Then we have axis. So axis could be seen down here. This is going to have a unique projection called the dens or the odontoid process. And you could see that in this photo where we have the atlas meeting the axis, the dens is attaching to an area known as the anterior facet or facet for dens. Sorry, it attaches to the facet for dens, but we have the anterior arch in that area behind it to form its joint. And then we are also going to have a bifid spinous process on the, uh, excuse me, on the axis. And we will start to see the transverse processes sticking out with the transverse foramen, those holes there. And that is because we're going to have an artery move through here known as the vertebral artery. Now, lastly, we're going to have um, C7 that has a special name, and that's vertebra prominence. And it was named that because it has the longest of all the spinous processes. And if you are trying to identify a vertebrae, if you remember that the cervical vertebrae have the bifid spinous process and the transverse foramen, that's going to help you know that for sure you have a cervical vertebrae. Some people say that the cervical vertebrae looks like the beetle because the beetle kind of has that bifid look to its mouth parts. Then we have our thoracic vertebrae. We are going to see this within the thorax region. And if you look on the transverse processes, you will find that transverse costal facet that will articulate with the tubercle of a corresponding rib. 
the head of the rib will then articulate with the body of the thoracic vertebrae. So you could see that a bit better in this photo where it's a transverse view of the vertebrae and the rib is coming in. There is the head of the rib articulating with the body of the vertebrae and the tubercle of the rib articulating with the transverse costal facet here on the transverse process. And if you're trying to identify a thoracic vertebrae, they tend to look like a giraffe with its long, more pointy spinous process. And you'll also want to look for the transverse costal facet here because no other type of vertebrae will have that. Next, we have our lumbar vertebrae, and this is going to carry the greatest amount of body weight and is going to be characterized by its thick bodies, thick vertebral bodies, and we have short transverse processes sticking out on the side here, and we have short quadrangular blunt spinous processes. So when you're trying to identify one of those vertebrae, you want to look for something that looks like a moose, or some people say it looks like an elephant. Now we are down in the sacrum region. So we've gone through cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, and lumbar vertebrae. So now with the sacrum, we're going to see that it is a triangle-shaped bone, and it's going to be thicker and wider at the superior end, where it is going to be more weight-bearing, and then it tapers down inferiorly. If we look at a posterior view, which I'm going to just switch to this image really quick. This is a posterior view of the sacrum. You could see the median sacral crest right along in here, and that is really remnant of the fused spinous processes of the vertebrae here. In this anterior view, we can see our sacral promontory. This is the anterior lip of the superior base, and we would have a intervertebral disc sitting right over here and above that would be L5, lumbar vertebrae 5. Now you may have noticed that we have these holes within the sacrum and so from an anterior view we would call these the anterior sacral foramina, foramina meaning many holes, and this is where we will have the anterior branches of sacral spinal nerves move through. On the posterior aspect, we will have the posterior sacral foramina where the posterior branches, branches will move through. Lastly, we have our coccyx, and this is known as our tailbone. You could see it is at the very end of the sacrum, and we, we said it was four fused vertebrae typically, but it can range from three to five. This is non-weight bearing, but it may be while we are sitting. I had to fix that little typo in there so it is not weight bearing. Now let's discuss what's sitting in between those vertebrae. We have the intervertebral disc here that is made up of a fibrocartilaginous pad that is going to fill the gaps between the vertebrae like we see here by sitting between the vertebral bodies. This helps to provide padding between each of the vertebrae during weight bearing. Now we do have two different parts. We have the annulus fibrosis, which is going to be tough fibrous outer layer of disc. And then the inner portion is made up of a nucleus pulposus that is going to be softer and made up of more of a gel-like material. Unfortunately, water content is gonna decline as we age and these will shrink and we will become shorter. Now for our thoracic cage. The major function of this will be to protect the heart and lungs. And so when we look at the anterior aspect of the thoracic cage, we can see the sternum. And this is broken up into three different parts. We have the manubrium, which is the wider superior portion of the sternum. Then we have the central portion known as the body that's going to receive the most force during chest compressions while administering CPR. And you could see several of our true ribs are attaching here. And then finally, we have our xiphoid process, which is easily broken if CPR is not administered correctly. Years ago when I learned CPR, they actually used to have you find this structure in order to put the base of your palm there and do CPR. They found that that led to fractures, and so they moved it to the lower sternum over here.
So don't do that. <laughs> All right, so continuing on with our rib cage, that's gonna consist of 12 pairs of ribs and we can classify these ribs. First, we have the red true ribs, which are seven pairs and they connect to the sternum via their own costal cartilage. And then we have the five um, pairs of false ribs. Notice how only three of these are in green, but we are going to include the floating ribs here as false ribs as well. So ribs eight through 12. And so we will only have two that classify as floating ribs. And the false ribs I forgot to mention connect to the sternum, not through their own costal cartilage. You can see in this view how they are attaching to the costal cartilage above and the floating ribs do not have any of the costal cartilage attachment. So they're just gonna have a little bit of hyaline cartilage at the ends and that's it. So that's it for chapter seven. Please let me know if you have any questions.